It's great to be back on the rock here celebrating with you this wonderful province and uh, relaunching our campaign to take the to keep the heat on and take the tax off, right? <laughs> Justin Trudeau and his team of liberal MPs who are working for Ottawa in Newfoundland and Labrador rather than Newfoundland and Labrador in Ottawa want to raise taxes on your home heating, your gas, your groceries, and they want to ban your hunting rifle as well. They're at it, right? We want to do precisely the opposite. Stand up for the hardworking people. Make your dollar go further. Axe the tax and defend the traditional way of life of our indigenous and our rural people by protecting your right to lawfully own hunting rifles and other firearms. <laughs> But I, before I get down to business, I have some very important people here that we have to recognize here. So I've got the list here. The great Ches Crosby. There he is right there, folks. Thank you, Ches, for all your support during my leadership campaign. We've got Lord, Lloyd Parrott. Where is Lloyd? All right, Lloyd's over there. Craig Party, MHA. Where is he? Tony Wakeham. Where's Tony? <laughs> Jeff Dwyer. Jeff Dwyer, MHA. There he is. Thanks for coming, Jeff. We've got the great Senator Fabian Manning. Where is Fabian? <laughs> and we've got uh, Judy Manning as well, the National Council for the Conservative Party. Where is Judy? There she is. Good to see you again, Judy. And is the mayor here as well? There he is. Zarius, where's John? There's John. Good to see you, John. Thank you very much for hosting us here today. It's great to, to be with my friend uh, Cliff Small. Uh, Cliff, uh, uh, when we got to Gander today, he said, we have to go and honor our seniors. To, we're going to go to a senior's residence. And I said, Cliff, they're not going to want to see a politician from Ottawa at the senior's residence. He said, no, you're going to be a big star. So I walked in. I walked up to a lady and I said, do you know who I am? And she said, no, but if you ask the nurse, she'll tell you who you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be made humble, isn't it? <laughs> that the mighty be made low. And uh, that's how our system's supposed to be. Remember, prime minister is supposed to mean prime servant, first servant, yeah. not master. This prime minister of ours has got the org chart upside down. He thinks he's the boss and the people work for him. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. And because of the arrogant, out-of-touch approach that he has, people feel like they're losing control of their lives these days. You know, half a trillion dollars of inflationary deficits, doubling the national debt, adding more debt than all previous prime ministers combined. All that money is bidding up the cost of the goods you buy and the interest you pay. Yeah, look, look around you. Half a trillion dollars of deficits have bought us terrible health care, rising crime, record drug overdoses, and a, a, a cost of living that people simply can't afford. Uh, earlier in my trip here to Newfoundland, I met seniors who are spending their days at Tim Hortons or at the shopping center so that they can turn the heat down and save money. One lady said she's spending $1,700 for a, t a tank of oil that lasts her six weeks. That's pretty much her entire paycheck. And then we have uh, people, 1.5 million Canadians eating at the food bank. In fact, some people are showing up at the Mississauga food bank asking for help with medical assistance and dying, not because they're sick, but because life has become so miserable and unaffordable that they don't want to go on living at all. And many people are losing their lives. 30,000 drug overdose deaths since Justin Trudeau took office. And now they want to expand medical assistance in dying to people who are suffering from mental illness. Rather than giving people the hope to go on living, they want to make it easy for the government by having state provided uh, medical assistance in dying for people whose only condition is that they are depressed or struggling. That's not the Canada that I grew up in. You know, when I, was, uh, when I was growing up, my parents taught me, you know, I was, as, as Cliff told you, I was born to a single mom who put me up for adoption to two school teachers. They taught me it didn't matter where I came from, mattered where I was going, didn't matter who I knew, it mattered what I could do. That's the country my wife came to as a refugee, and that's the country I want my kids to inherit. 
but it means yes, that's right. It means we want to put people back in charge of their lives by making this once again the freest country on earth. And let's get down to some of the specifics. Well, one of the reasons we have this out of control inflation is because the cost of government is driving up the cost of living. I'm going to cap government spending with a new dollar for dollar law that requires the government find a dollar of savings for every new dollar of unbudgeted spending. And there's lots of waste. We know there's lots of waste out there they can cut, but there's no incentive for them to cut it because they just passed the bill on in higher debt, taxes, and inflation. Just today, we found out that the total hotel room cost for all of the fancy people that went to the Queen's funeral was $400,000. This is a three-day delegation. One of the rooms cost $6,000 per night for a single room. Cliff, who stayed in that room? <laughs> were, you were you staying in that room? It was just the Prime Minister. It was just the Prime Minister. Well, we asked, I asked Justin Trudeau five times on the floor of the House of Commons who stayed in the room. He won't tell us. So anybody got any guesses who the mystery man or the mystery woman is who stayed in that room? Well, the Taxpayers Federation is actually taking the government to court to find out who stayed in that room. Yeah. Uh, don't you think it's time we find out? So we, we got Canadians who are forced to live in homeless shelters while they go to university. The Prime Minister has a friend <laughs> that's staying in $6,000 room uh, hotel rooms. But it's not just the hotel. It's the $54 million for the Arrive Can app. The, an app that didn't work, wasn't necessary, and could have been designed for $300,000. They spent $30 billion on wage subsidies to companies that were profitable enough to pay out dividends and bonuses to their executives. That money was supposed to go to companies that were hurting, not those that were helping their most wealthy and most powerful people. They're giving billions of dollars in loan guarantees to large infrastructure companies so that if the project goes under and loses money, the taxpayer picks up the profit, but the cost, and, and, but if the project goes well, then the company takes away the profit. They've increased the size of the federal bureaucracy by 30% in eight years, and on top of that, They've doubled the amount of money they spend on outsourcing to consultants because apparently all these extra public servants are not able to do the work in-house, including McKinsey, $100 million for McKinsey. So there's lots of waste in this government, but we need to incentivize the system to save the money. So we're going to cut back on the high-priced consultants. By capping spending, we'll force ministers and deputy ministers to make the same either-or decisions with your money that you make in your household. If you want to build that extra porch, you might take a pass on the vacation, or you might work at getting a bargain on both, but in your household, you can't go over budget. Government should be the same. It should live by the same laws of scarcity that applies to every creature in the universe, except the politician. Well, let's bring that rule on the backs of politicians so that they have to make the tough choices to save money so that we can phase out the deficit. The Americans brought in this law back in the 1990s and they were able to phase out the deficit and, and pay down $400 billion of debt. And as soon as that law lapsed, they went right back into deficit and haven't reemerged since, which proves politicians need laws to, li to limit their spending. They need to be disciplined by law or they will spend irresponsibly. I'm going to bring in that law. We're going to balance the budget. We're, you've been pinching your pennies long enough. It's time that politicians started pinching their pennies too. Yeah. And we're going to axe the carbon tax. Yeah. Yeah. Axe the carbon tax. We put forward a motion in the House of Commons to say, listen, the NDP and Liberals want to triple, triple, triple the tax. Apply it to your heat, your gas, your groceries, and everything else. But for God's sake, show a little bit of compassion and at least take it off people's home heating bills. And we put that motion in the House of Commons and there was only one lowly Liberal member of Parliament who voted with us. From Newfoundland, actually. By Ken McDonald, right? But all the other Liberals voted like train seals for Justin Trudeau's tax, which proves again that we need to elect more conservatives in Newfoundland and Labrador to stand up for your ability to pay your bills. <laughs> yeah. 
This tax does nothing for our environment. We've missed every single climate change tar target since Trudeau took office. What it does is drives prices up and production out and pollution up in other parts of the world. I'll give you an example. We have a little greenhouse in my riding. No, not that type of greenhouse. Uh, it's, it's, it's tomatoes. They grow uh, tomatoes inside um, the greenhouse and they have to pump CO2 into, this, into the greenhouse to increase the productivity of the plants. Well, Trudeau charges the carbon tax on that CO2, even though it goes right into the plant life and not into the atmosphere. Apparently, he missed that day in science class, <laughs> right? So what happens? It makes the local tomato in Ottawa more expensive than the, Ma the Mexican tomato in Ottawa. So the price signal says to the consumer, why don't you buy the tomato from Mexico, which doesn't have a carbon tax on it, even though it is transported by train and truck, burning diesel the whole way across North America, far more polluting tomato in the, in the Ottawa grocery store than the local one. So in fact, this is actually harming the environment. By driving production out of our country, we drive it to more polluting foreign jurisdictions. So what we're going to do under my government is we're going to get rid of the carbon tax, the tariffs off of our uh, our fertilizer so that we can produce more of our food right here in Canada. That's good for our environment, it's good for our farmers, it's good for our consumers. And instead of creating more cash, we're going to create more of what cash buys. In addition to growing more food, we're going to build more houses and produce more Canadian energy here on this soil of ours. Listen, we have the fewest houses per capita of any country in the G7, even though we have the most land to build on. That's why we have the third worst housing bubble on planet Earth. Makes no sense. Like if we were Singapore or an island without any land, you could understand home prices being exorbitant. But not in Canada. We've got more land than we know what to do with. But local gatekeepers in big cities prevent construction. In Vancouver, $600,000 of the price of every house is actually government bureaucracy and taxes. And that all gets passed on to the consumer. No wonder, and then, uh, then the city folks have to move further out to the country, and that inflates housing prices right across the land. A poly of government is going to bring in a new condition for big cities with overpriced real estate that I'll be linking the number of dollars they get for infrastructure to the number of houses that get built to incentivize them to lower the cost and increase the speed of building permits. I'll require that every federally funded transit station have high density housing approved around it. I'm going to sell off 15% of the 37,000 federal buildings we have in this country. Many of them are completely vacant because of people are working from home. Sell them off, turn them into housing. It warms my heart, Cliff, to think of the beautiful family pulling up in their U-Haul to move into their wonderful new home in the former headquarters of the CBC. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and we're going to support the trades, right? Yeah. You know, well, everything's about university. Fine. Look, I went to university. It's fine. But what we need are people who can build stuff in this country. We should be encouraging our young people to go into the trades, get an apprenticeship. You get paid. You can earn while you learn. And then we'll have the building trades that actually build the houses we need. We need more of the practical people in this country. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do by ensuring that the federal government favors the trades as much as the professions, the colleges and the polytechnics as much as the universities, the blue collar, uh, the working people as much as the white collar. We think that we need the people to build the houses. We're going to build millions of new homes so that our young people can have a place to live and put a roof overhead. And, and for the uh, older people in the room, you know what this means for you? Beautiful grandchildren. Or you can't have grandchildren when, they're, when, the, when your parents, your kids are living in your basement till 35, right? In fact, I was in Vancouver recently, and I said, if you're still living at home when you're 35, how do you bring a date home? And the lady yelled out very carefully. Oh. <laughs> but seriously, think about the psychological impact it has on a young person when they can't get a home, start a family, build up home equity, credit history and collateral, the necessities of an economic life. You can't take control of your life until you own a place of your own. And that should be a given, that when you're a young person in this country, if you work hard, your paycheck should be big enough, you should keep enough of it that you can afford to make a mortgage payment and start your life. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to bring home home 
ownership when Pierre Polyev is Prime Minister. You know, and for a nation to take control of its destiny, it must be energy independent. And there's no excuse for Canada to be otherwise. We have the third biggest supply of oil on planet Earth, and yet Justin Trudeau wants to us to import overseas oil from places like Saudi Arabia. 130,000 barrels of overseas oil imported to Canada every single day. Most of it in St. John, New Brunswick, right? Well, that's partly because we have Bill C-69, the anti-energy law that stops oil and gas production and many other mining activities from across this country. Uh, and that's why I'm going to repeal C-69. We're going to build pipelines. We're going to approve more oil and gas projects. And I'm going to back up Newfoundland's plan to more than double its production so that we can produce 400,000 more barrels of oil every single day in eastern Canada to fully replace the 130,000 that are coming in from overseas. And we will become energy independent under Pierre Polyev. We'll bring it home. It's not just oil, it's natural gas. We have 1,300 trillion cubic feet of natural gas here in Canada. And they need it in Europe. The German Chancellor came over here asking for our gas. The Japanese Prime Minister came for the very same reason. And Justin Trudeau said, no, go to the Kremlin. Call Vladimir Putin. He'll provide you with natural gas. And of course, he'll ra use the money to fight his wars. So we're, we're, we're sending money over to Vladimir Putin by keeping our natural gas in the ground. When Trudeau took office eight years ago, we had 15 proposed natural gas projects. Not a single one of them has been approved. We do not export a single solitary cubic foot of natural gas overseas. It stays in the ground or it goes at a discount to the Americans when we could be profiting from it here at home. When, when I'm Prime Minister, I'm going to be approving natural gas projects. You know why we have a massive advantage? What are the advantages we have in gas? One, that we are the shortest shipping distance to both Europe and Asia from North America. Two, you know how you turn gas into a liquid so it can go on a ship? You know how? You cool it down. What do we have in Canada? Lots of cold weather. It's our most abundant natural resource. Right? So we're going to, when I'm Prime Minister, we're going to approve natural gas projects including LNG, Newfoundland, and Labrador. <laughs> LNG, Newfoundland, Labrador. And the people of this great province will pipe that gas from the Jandark oil field over to the coast, put it on a ship, cool it to minus 161 degrees Celsius, send it overseas to Europe break the European dependence on Putin and turn dollars for dictators into paychecks for our people in this country. Let's bring it home. And we're going we're gonna to produce the minerals, the strategic minerals of the future. I was speaking to some ind indigenous people from northern Ontario the other day. They had this thing called the Ring of Fire. Incredible minerals there. I've been talking about it for 15 years, but nothing's happening. Why? Permitting takes too long. In fact, they've been waiting five years to get a permit for a highway to get to the future mines. And I asked these indigenous leaders, are the shovels in the ground? They said the snow shovels are in the ground. They have snow roads still. Five years and $50 million spent trying to get a permit, and the permit is not even granted. This is the gatekeeper economy that I keep talking about. We need to clear the way, quickly approve these projects so that all the minerals that go into electrification and to the future economy actually come from Canadian soil. We're going to stop exporting our jobs, our businesses, and our opportunities. We're going to bring it home. We're going to put our country first, our workers first, our people first, and let's make it happen here in this country. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, because higher prices and fewer opportunities have become more common in this country, uh, people feel like they're losing control of their lives, they're losing hope. Uh, you know, you think about uh, the drug overdose crisis. Um, these powerful drug companies came to North America over the last several decades and they sold these opioids. And they told the medical system it was totally safe. And you don't have to worry about it, it's not addictive and it's not lethal. And what they did is preyed on working class people who were suffering. And now here in Canada this problem has 
worsened. It's become a massive crisis. 30,000 people have died in the last seven years. In British Columbia, there's been a 300% increase in drug overdoses. Now, the solution Trudeau and the NDP offer is to legalize fentanyl, heroin, crack, cocaine, and other drugs. And they're trying it as a pilot project in Vancouver. Tent cities have resulted where half a dozen people die every single day, face down on the pavement. Police are not even allowed to do anything about it, and the local authorities hand out the drugs, saying that it's safer if people can get the drugs from the government. Well, that hasn't happened. In fact, more overdoses have resulted as people are not satisfied with the drugs the government gets. They resell those into the market to buy the harder stuff that's actually killing them. A poly of government is not going to give up on people in this way. In fact, instead of legalizing drugs, we're going to massively expand drug treatment. We're going to provide detox serve and counseling and other programs that will help people take back control of their lives. And you know what else we're going to do? The same thing with those pharmaceutical companies that governments did 25 years ago with the tobacco companies. A poly of government will sue the pharmaceutical companies that did this in the first place and make them pay the full price of the recovery and treatment. And by the way, that includes McKinsey, Justin Trudeau's favorite consulting firm. This company, which put together plans to turbocharge the sale of those drugs across North America, including paying bonuses out to distributors who helped deliver drug overdoses. They literally did that. They, they will be on the list of, of defendants who will have to explain what they did to our working class people. We're going to make them pay the price and other drug companies pay the price for the horrors that they have unleashed in our cities. And we're going to give hope back to our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our neighbors. We're going to overcome this crisis and give people the hope of a drug-free life in the future. Um, and we're going to stop... We're going to stop the insanity of the criminal justice system, which targets all the wrong people. You know, Trudeau's now going after hunters. I've got news for him. It is not the hunter in Labrador that's shooting up downtown Toronto, <laughs> right? <laughs> in fact, we know who's doing all the shootings. It's money, it's drugs that are coming, sorry, it's guns that are coming over the border from smugglers. 82% of firearms used in crime in Toronto come in illegally across the border. It is not those firearms in the possession of people who have PALs. If you got a PAL, your possession and acquisition license, you probably went through all the steps of getting trained and vetted, and the RCMP called your spouse to make sure that you're okay upstairs, right? The people who go through all those steps don't tend to rob banks, right? In fact, one of my MPs, Bob Zimmer, did a study to find that people with PALs, possession and acquisition license, are half as likely to commit a firearms offense than people a random person on the streets. That the people who own rifles are our safest and most responsible people. They're using their firearms not only for recreational purposes, but in many parts of this country for sustenance itself. And so I want to tell you that Polyev government, in fact, a Polyev-led opposition in the meantime, will fight tooth and nail against Trudeau's ban on, on firearms, and we will defend your right to hunt and carry out the Canadian traditions. And we'll go after the real source of crime. In Vancouver, 40 offenders were arrested 6,000 times in one year. Think about that. That's 150 arrests per offender per year. But Justin Trudeau's bail reforms allow them to be released the same day they're arrested. <laughs> Automatic bail. So violent offender commits a crime at 10 a.m. He gets arrested, goes in, gets arraigned, gets bail. He's out by 1, 1 p.m. Goes in, commits another crime smashes somebody's face up, gets arrested, goes in, gets bail a second time in the same day. And then by midnight, he's probably been arrested a total of three times. Well, that's three people's lives who may have been destroyed. What we're going to do is repeal these insane bane bail rules, put people behind bars. If they have a track record of repeat violent offenses, they should stay in jail until such time as their trial occurs, and if they're convicted, until such time as their sentence has been fully served. That's the solution. Right. Really, it's about common sense, isn't it? It's common sense. You know, it's uncommon, though, these days, isn't it? And that's the problem. We have this uh, gr elite group 
that thinks it knows better than everyone else. They want to make your decisions for you. In faraway places, sometimes it's not just Ottawa, it's over in Davos. And that's why I'm so proud that I made the commitment during my leadership race and we've kept it ever since. Not a single solitary conservative MP is part of the World Economic Forum and they will never be. We're, we're going to stand up for the common people. You know, here we are in a Legion Hall. It's the Legionnaires of today and the soldiers of yesteryear who protected our freedom. And you, any Winston Churchill fans in this room? I've got a lot of Winston Churchill. You know what I like most about Churchill? It's not just his 58 volumes of Nobel Prize winning literature. It's not just that he defended uh, the free world against Nazism and communism. It's not even just the brilliant speeches that broadcasted over British airwaves and around the world in our hour of need. It's that he was a real champion of the common man. He actually, while he was a politician, joined the Bricklayers Union. He was terrible at laying bricks, but he admired the people who could. His staff had to come behind and pull the bricks out before the grout dried and fix them and put them properly in their place. But he always admired the common people. And my, the most touching story of his incredible life for me is the following. He used to go out into the streets of London after the Germans had bombed the city out and there'd be nothing but rubble. And he'd walk up to the people and hear their stories, how they survived, and listen to uh, their hopes and aspirations to rebuild. And one day they stumbled along an elderly lady who'd been buried under rubble. And so slowly they gathered around her and they swept away the rocks and stones and debris. And she, she'd been out shopping that day when she was trapped under this, uh, this falling rubble. And amazingly, she wasn't badly injured. She stood up, she grabbed her groceries, and she said, Prime Minister, I'd love to stay and talk, but I've got things to do. <laughs> and she marched off along her day. And Churchill staff looked over at him and noticed that he had tears pouring down his face. And he said, there goes greatness. He understood that the war would not, yes, that's right. He understood that the war would not be won by kings and queens. It would not even be won by prime ministers. It would be won by the defiance and determination of people like that woman. The, the people who fought on the front lines and the people who worked in the factories to generate the munitions every single day. These common people, the common people who do the work of the nation, the common people whom we represent on the floor of the House of Commons, where the floors are green because the first commoners met in the fields. The House of Commons is the House of Common People. It's the only place that the king and before him the queen is not even allowed to go because it belongs to you and I and not to royalty. The common people, when I think of the common people, I think of the waitress who is a single mom and raises her own kids. We say that she's ordinary, but actually she is extraordinary. The mechanic who can take apart and put back together an engine we call him an ordinary man, but actually he is an extraordinary man. The farmer, who must know all of the sciences of the weather and all the prices of the commodities and all of the risks that come with the pests of the land, he, he's called an ordinary man, but in fact he is extraordinary. All of these people have a kind of wisdom and a kind of sense that is lacking among the most privileged and the most powerful. We have to remember that we work for those common, extraordinary people. The common people in the House of Commons. In the words of the great Canadian Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I think wrong, free to worship God in my own way, free to choose those who shall govern my country, this heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and for all of mankind. Now let's bring it home, my friends. Thank you very much.